Welcome. My name is Ricky Bevington. I'm president of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit membership forum for informed discussion of global affairs that impact Metro Atlanta. And we're so pleased to have you today along with our guest speaker. You can learn about membership in the council at our website, wacatlanta.org. We have a broad and diverse audience online taking time out from their busy Tuesday to hear more from Dan Rundy. I would especially like to thank World Affairs Council of Atlanta board member Jag Sheff for being here on our Zoom. Our topic today is the great power competition and the role of soft power. So to explore this, our guest today is Dan Rundy, who has spent the last 20 years working on global development and American soft power. He is Senior Vice President, Director of the Project on Prosperity and Development and the William A. Schreier Chair in Global Analysis at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And prior to CSIS, he held leadership positions at USAID and the World Bank Group and worked in both commercial and investment banking. And his new book, The American Imperative, Reclaiming Global Leadership Through Soft Power, looks at our non-military power through the lens of the great power competition. And I'm going to quote from part of the book, which I think will frame this conversation. This book hopes to spark a national conversation about how and for what end we will use our non-military forms of our power overseas, given the challenges and opportunities in front of us. That is the conversation we're having today. Dan Rundy, welcome to the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Ricky, I'm so grateful to you. I love the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. I love the city of Atlanta. I really appreciate the warm welcome you've given me, and thank you for giving me this platform and this opportunity. I'm really grateful to you and to your colleagues and to all your listeners today. Um, I wrote this book because uh, I think uh, we need to have a national conversation about how we're going to use our soft power in this new age of great power competition. We are in an age of great power competition with, with China and with Russia, and I'm going to ask for a hall pass from your listeners, you know, that, that the young people say a hall pass, I'm asking for a waiver and permission. So when I'm going to use the term China a lot, and I'm going to use the word Russia a lot. And when I say the word China, I want people to think Chinese Communist Party. And when I say Russia, I want people to think Vladimir Putin's murderous regime that's illegally invaded Ukraine and has committed war crimes. So I'm not saying the Chinese people, and I'm not necessarily saying the Russian people, which I think is maybe perhaps a little bit more controversial these days, but I would also say that I, we're not, we don't have a problem with the Chinese people and we don't necessarily have a problem with the Russian people. And so I think when we also probably as part of our conversation, we want to think about how we engage the Chinese people and how we engage the Russian people, because I think that's also going to be an important part of kind of how we, how we operate in the world. But I think we're in an age of great power competition. And my big deep thought is that this great power competition, Ricky, is not going to happen in Russia, and it's not going to happen in China. It's going to happen in Latin America. It's going to happen in Africa. It's going to happen in the Pacific Island states. It's going to happen in Central Asia. It's going to happen in Southeast Asia. It's going to happen in Ukraine and Moldova. It's going to happen largely in terms of, for this conversation, largely in the global South, but not necessarily only in the global South, but most or much of it is going to play out in the developing world. And most of it is not going to be military. It's going to be about ideas. It's about going to be about economic development. It's going to be about values. It's going to be about technology. It's going to be about health. It's going to be about the multilateral system. It's going to be about international education and training. And it's going to be about global standards and who leads on that. And so if that's the case, and if you buy what I'm selling, if you buy what I'm, my premise, then what we need is a national strategy in partnership with our allies and friends and also working with all sorts of stakeholders in our society, the philanthropy world, the private sector, the third sector, faith communities, to have a go in a, in a direction on what we're going to do in the non-military space to respond to this challenge. Because what's different than 15 years ago or even 10 years ago is that the Chinese Communist Party has the ability to fill voids that we leave behind. So leadership is a choice. And if we leave voids, China and its sidekick, Russia, can fill voids that we leave behind. 
And you actually, uh, you start the book with the example of Myanmar as, an, as a good illustration of why and how to use soft power. So you give many, many examples, but why don't we start with Myanmar as an illustration of that learning yes. from the past? Yeah, thanks. So we, um, Myanmar is a country that was cut off from the rest of the world for many decades. And there had been an election in the early 90s and there, it looked as if Aung San Suu Kyi had won that election and it sparked a, a, a military takeover of the society. And so they were cut off and they looked to partnership, a deep partnership with China. A couple of things happened about 15 years ago. One of the things that happened about 15 years ago is that the Chinese government uh, uh, really overplayed their hand and were too overbearing and mistreated the junta the you know these are not necessary these are not the vienna boys choir these are not nice people but they were they were disrespected and mistreated by the chinese communist party in such a way that the junta in myanmar was so over over a dam i can't pronounce the name of it but it's a big dam that china was building and around sort of the terms of the use of the water and the and the energy and the costs etc and so the junta was so appalled by the treatment that they got at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. They said, we would like to revisit our relationships with the rest of the world because we are being horribly disrespected and mistreated by the Chinese Communist Party. The second thing that happened was there are two other things happened. One was that there was a terrible cyclone, an awful cyclone. And the United States government at the end of the Bush administration sent high level, very generous amounts of assistance to respond to the cyclone. And we sent, uh, and I, I, we do this in every emergency. This is just part of being, the American people being generous, uh, people in, in Atlanta being responding to emergencies around the world. You do this in your private capacity and the American government does this in their capacity as well. Well, there's a concept called enlightened self-interest. We should do the right thing for the right reasons, but it also sometimes get we get something else in return for that. And it also created kind of a, I'm gonna describe it as, a sort of semi-diplomatic opening to have a different kind of a conversation with Myanmar because we responded in a generous way from a, for a good reasons, but it also opened the door. The third thing that happened was um, two people I know well, one a Republican, one a Democrat in Washington who are uh, Asia watchers, um, Mike Green and um, Derek Mitchell, Ambassador Derek Mitchell wrote an important piece in, around this, all this is happening saying that now would be a time to rethink our policy towards Myanmar. And so between sort of this disaster, the overplaying of the hand of China, and also sort of this, this proposal to do something different, we the Obama administration made a series of steps to try and engage the government of Myanmar. There were, uh, there were free and fair elections or free and fair-ish elections or fair enough elections, if I can put it that way. And the U.S. government was very involved with that. The organization I'm on the board of called the International Foundation for Electoral Systems worked with the government of Myanmar to work on these things, to, to try and help create free free enough and fair enough elections for people to say like, yeah, this, and the, the opposition won. And so Aung San Suu Kyi's party uh, took over the government. And so there was sort of a lot of hope and there was a lot of opening within Myanmar over sort of a six or seven year period. Secretary of State Clinton visited. In fact, President Obama made a historic visit to Myanmar. So there was a lot of hope and, and hope that there was gonna be uh, opening and change in Myanmar. And for a number of years there were. But what happened was there were some elections a couple of years ago. And for a number of reasons, the, the military leadership got afraid and took back control of Myanmar and said, we're gonna go back to having a partnership with mainland China, which isn't so great for, for the Myanmar people and it's not great for them. And then there was, a, there, were up, there was a popular unrest about all of this. And as a result, uh, we're in kind of a, we're sort of sadly back where we started with a lot of damage, if I can put it that way. There's a lot more to it and it's more complicated than that. But what I would say is we engage with diplomacy, we engage with our foreign assistance in terms of responding to an emergency, we responded with trying to support democratic actors and civil society. And we also tried to help create new economic ties with Myanmar, with the rest of the world. 
and it almost worked. And if we, my hope and belief was that if we had a little bit more time, and if we could deal with some of the core issues, that, you know, I tried to help Myanmar with some of the core issues in their society, their complicated multi-ethnic, their complex multi-ethnic society. If we'd help, if we'd had a little bit more time, perhaps things could have gone in a different way. But the point is that we there was an opening and a window, and the Obama administration, the late Bush administration, and the Obama administration rightly took it, and we did our best. And it doesn't mean it's always going to work. But it means that we ought to try. And that's the reason I, I put that story in there. And the book is full of stories. Um, and I think for our audience, many of whom have a lot of experience with uh, the State Department, with aid organizations, but some who don't. So I'm going to make sure that I lean us toward being able to talk about concepts of the liberal world order or the great power competition yeah. or soft power in a very broad term so that everybody in the audience can really be on the same page with us. Can we go back for a minute and um, just define soft power beyond just non-military power? Yeah. Maybe you could get into some of the nuances of the types of aid. And then the great power competition, that's not a, a yet a household uh, expression. No. And why don't you frame that for our audience okay, as well? Great. So soft power, I'll start with, when I say soft power, you should think of everything other than sort of intelligence capacities, and our non-military power, but I'll get into what I mean by that in a little more detail. There was a book by Joseph Nye that talked about soft power as a concept of being attractive and wanting people to people wanting to follow you because you had sort of an attractive mouth. So some of it's about that, but I'm I'm taking a slightly broader, more ecumenical definition of soft power. I include things like our humanitarian assistance, like the example I used in Myanmar. Some of it's about our support for democracy, human rights, and good governance which is an entire, so there's an entire practice. And uh, it's also things like people to people connections. So in Atlanta, I suspect Atlanta is the sister city of a number of cities around the world. That matters. That sort of connectivity is really important. And more important than I think we kind of give credit to is in, in, in the collective, it's really important. I think also really important, I talk about this in the book, I have a chapter on international education and training. I think we underestimate the fact, I think we have something like a million foreign students that come and study in the United States every year. A lot of them are from China, about two or 300,000 are from China, but 600,000 are from other parts of the world. This is one of America's superpowers, you know, to use the teenage terms. I've got teenagers, so I learn all these terms, Ricky. But we, the experience of studying and living in the United States makes folks aware of our weaknesses. And I think everyone on this call are very aware of our flaws and our challenges and our problems in the United States. But I think we also undersell ourselves and sell ourselves short on our strengths. And so I think many international students come and are appreciative and aware of our flaws, but are very, come back, very appreciative of our strengths. And we have many strengths. And one of our strengths is our higher education system as a whole. Now, I know some people will say, like, I don't want to think about international education and training as sort of a, an influence operation. But indirectly, it's a form of influence, and it's really important. I also think some of the things like trade, some of it's about technology, some of it's about leadership in the multilateral system, I think is worth worthy of kind of a, a little bit of several minutes of a conversation. So it's a series, it's also straight up diplomacy, like, you know, negotiating treaties, but it's also more importantly, things like public diplomacy, like strategic messaging and communications. I don't talk enough about it in the book, and I'm thinking about doing a book just on kind of strategic communications and public diplomacy, but also the concept of what's called commercial diplomacy how we engage and whether it's trade agreements, but also trying to represent the United States and for people to think about, um, you know, investing in a place like Georgia or investing in a place like Atlanta or Amer Georgian Atlanta based companies, many of them are global like UPS, you know, that have a global presence, making sure that we have a, a and it's important because American companies bring their standards, they bring their supply chains, they bring rule of law, and they bring expectations and they follow rules around anti-corruption practices that are really important. So when I talk about soft power, I mean all of those things. And then you asked me about great power competition. You're right. It's not really a, a household word. Um, so what I would, what I'm trying to get at is, is that in the past we had, you all know what the Cold War is. Your listeners all remember that there was the Soviet Union and the United States. And so there were kind of two systems, kind of two closed systems. And then after the Cold War, there was a period from, I'm going to say 1991, 
let's just say for argument's sake, from 1991 until about 2015 or 2011, so for at least 20 years and maybe 25 years, there is a period where you could call the post-Cold War era, where the United States was sort of the leader of the world, if you will. And then since about 2015, we've woken up to the fact that China is the second largest economy in the world. You've also had a re re resurgent Russia, uh, at least in some areas, specifically military, in some way, parts of its military, sort of its behavior as sort of a dis disruptor. And then what you've also had is that they have enough ability to kind of fill voids that we leave behind. So whether, so with this area of great power competition, what we're talking about is if we don't provide a technology solution to close the digital divide, anywhere in the world, whether it's Moldova, Malaysia, or Mali, they're gonna go to Chinese firms to close the digital divide. If we don't answer the mail on COVID vaccines, they're gonna go to Sputnik or Sinovac to get their crappy COVID vaccines, but they're gonna get the vaccines. If we can enable an alternative for airports or port construction, they're going to call mainland China to finance and build airports and port construction. We don't have to meet them dollar for dollar, but that's a thing. That's So it's also in the form of values to the extent that we're not standing up for human rights. We're not standing up for an anti-corruption agenda. We're not standing up for democracy. Um, there's a lot of con countries in the world that are authoritarian curious. They, you know, they kind of, they're kind of. Tell me about that. Tell me about what it's like to have one party rule and control of all the media. That sounds awesome, right? So a lot, unfortunately, a lot of leaders really like that. And the other problem is that the bad guys have gotten better at being bad, Ricky. And so as a result, sort of, there's lots of technical terms for this kind of like closing civil space, closing public, you know, civil society space. Like it's gotten harder and harder for kind of pushing to try and create human freedom and flourishing in the world. So if we don't, but my point in all this, and what's the liberal international order? The liberal international order is then, and so that's, so great power competition is the space where they now have the ability to fill voids that we leave. And so we're competing, yeah, in military terms. And so people talk a lot in Washington about the South China Sea and Taiwan Strait and a number of really important military aspects. But my argument is, is that most of this competition is not military. And so that's why I wrote the book, The American Imperative, Reclaiming Global Leadership Through Soft Power, because we need a non-military strategy. I also, I think you used the term, Ricky, liberal international order, and that's an important term. And I don't mean liberal in the term of progressive, uh, liberal in the sense of sort of like a free market, democracy, international order. So I think when you say liberal, like European liberal, if, if you, all your listeners are sophisticated, know what that means. But it's think of it as like market, democracy, international order. OK, and that was set up after World War II. And there were a series of Lego building blocks of that order. So some of it was things like setting up the United Nations. The United Nations is the term of the victors who won World War II. Franklin Delano Roosevelt talked about the United Nations. So when we set up the United Nations, it was about the victors in setting up a new set of rules and kind of rules of the road after World War II. Second, there was things called the Bretton Woods institutions. These are things like the World Bank and the IMF and a trading system. There's lots of pressures and competition on all that stuff, but these were kind of building blocks. Then there were certain security arrangements. There's a thing called NATO. You all know what that is on this call, North American, uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, but other things as well. The key component of the liberal international order was that the United States was willing to pay the condo fees of global leadership to sustain this. Not on its own. There was always a, an assumption that if you're a beneficiary of this system, you would also pay condo fees in your way. And I would argue, and I don't know if I talk, I don't think I talk about this enough in the book. I would argue that in the since the Obama administration, sometimes more politely, as in the Obama administration and in the Biden administration, and perhaps more crudely and more aggressively and rudely in the Trump administration and more perhaps irresponsibly in the Trump administration, the argument has been we would like to renegotiate, the United States would like to renegotiate the, the condo fee sharing arrangement across the system. The, rearrange, the burden sharing across the system. We would like not to get rid of the system, but we'd like to renegotiate in different aspects of it, burden sharing and cost sharing. 
And I want to ask the listeners to do a little bit of an of a brief imagination exercise. And so Matt, these all these building blocks I've talked about, mainland China and Russia today ha almost have the ability. They don't fully have the ability to do this, but they're in the, they're in the, they're going to make an attempt to try and do this. They would like to set up a separate Lego setup with different Lego building blocks to create an alternate arrangement, a different kind of an order, a different kind of set of rules of the road where China, an authoritarian regime, gets to set these, is the standard maker, not the standard taker, where things like authoritarianism are favored, where rule of law is de-emphasized, where corruption is encouraged, where certain kinds of um, interventions in people's most personal decisions about whether or not, um, you know, how many children people should have, because they were really big until like 20 minutes ago on this one child policy, and that hasn't worked out so well for them, or certain kinds of behaviors in terms of people's most personal decisions. Also, they also, this would be an order where religious freedom, if that's important to you, it's really important to me, uh, is de-emphasized and crushed. So, if you think about all the things, if you care about environmental concerns like climate change, do you? I would ask your listeners, do you believe in your heart of hearts that the Chinese Communist Party is a better steward of environmental stewardship than the United States of America and the West? Like we can, you can say, okay, well, the, they're doing more on solar panels and whatever, but they are producing coal plants once a week. They're the largest emitter in the world. And so if anyone is going to tell me that they're a better steward, I don't believe it. And I don't believe on any of the values that any of your listeners hold here. I haven't had anybody in the West tell me yet, you know what, that would be cool. I think it'd be so awesome for China to lead the world. That would be amazing. I haven't had a single person in Washington yet tell me, man, that would be great. They can have it. They should rule the world. They should set the standards. They can set the rules of the road on religious freedom. They can set the rules of the road on environmental standards. They can set the rules of road on people's personal household, personal decisions at their most personal things about children. They can set the rules of road on corruption. I haven't met a single MAGA hat person yet. The most MAGA hat per wearing person you can think of. I haven't, I've yet to have somebody say to me who's, who would say like, I don't want to burden share as much. And that's okay. Are you, are you cool with the idea of mainland China see, see, taking over and leading in this space? And when I engage the Trump administration, Ricky, and when I asked that question, time after time, the answer was no. After a lot of hemming and hawing and grumbling and gritting of teeth, the Trump administration say, no, I don't want that. And then they would take more responsible decisions. And I know many of your listeners will sound that that will sound weird, but in a number of examples, they made responsible decisions at the end of the day. I know for a fact, because I engage with them on it, out of fear of China leading the world. And I would ask your listeners, do you want that? And I would bet you, you know, maybe there's one person just to be just to be clever or kind of be provocative will say, I'm cool with that. But I would bet the vast majority of the listeners are going to say, heck no, I don't want that. So if that's the case, we need to protect the current system. Maybe we need to renegotiate the terms of sort of the burden sharing. And that's what I think we've been doing since the Obama administration. But um, if we don't lead they will fill the void and replace the current arrangement with something you are not going to like. I trust, trust me, you and your kids, my kids are going to hate. And so I wrote this book because I don't want that to happen. If we should point out that when you talk about MAGA hat people in the Trump administration, this is your party. You're I'm a Republican, yeah. A lifelong Republican. Yeah. But you also call yourself a conservative internationalist. And in yeah. this, I'm, I want you to explain to our audience why the solution that you're putting forward is a bi not bipartisan, but at least as you pointed out, that Democrats and Republicans share to your mind an agreement that that the alternative is worse than all of the mistakes the U.S. has made, which is many. We could spend years yeah, could talking them. about that, but that's actually not what you're saying. You're saying, but these alternatives are even worse. So, what does it mean to be a conservative internationalist? So, I think. What I think it means is, is that I think at the end of the day, if you're pressed, do you want China and Russia to lead the world? The answer has got to be, we, we should not want that. So I don't want that. I want the United States for the next hundred years to lead the international system. I want us to be a standard maker, not a standard taker. I want American businesses to be the envy of the world. Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. I want people, I want a lot of people coming here 
to see the American way of life because nothing beats seeing the American way of life. Like I said, there's some problems in our society, but we undersell the pluses. People come away saying, holy cow, this it's pretty, some of the things that the United States does is pretty amazing. So I want people coming back. I want people at the end, when they become, if they study in Atlanta, what I want is to have Boston on the speed dial, not Beijing on the speed dial. So I don't want people studying in Beijing. I want them studying in Boston or Atlanta. So what it means is, is that it doesn't necessarily mean we're going to, uh, I, I think I'm interested in having the United States continue to lead in the world, set global standards, uh, and continue to, uh, and, and work towards building out a larger universe of market democracies over time. My over time, my finger is on the scale of human rights and good governments and democracy. Uh, it also, I would say is that we're, I'm interested in, I, you know, I, people like Ronald Reagan, HW Bush, John McCain, Mitt Romney, W in Bush 43, for all people I admire and like very much. So I think, I know what the question is going to be, Ricky, which is, okay, well, is that the Republican Party of today? And because I've gotten that question a lot. And so I would say, if I look at the current U.S. Congress, if I put the question to elected officials in the Republican Party, are you cool with China leading the world? I don't think there's any Republican elected officials going to be like, yes, I'm cool with that. Now, are you are they prepared to pay the price or the burdens that I think are implied with kind of U.S. continued the U.S. leadership? I think when you press them and you push them, most of them will do that. And let me give you some examples. So the Trump administration came in and said, we're going to get rid of the Exim Bank, the U.S. Export Import Bank. That's So your listeners know what the U.S. Export Import Bank is, or mo I'm sure most all of them do. Um, there are some people in the Republican Party that hate it and think it's like a form of corporate welfare. I don't. I was a big proponent of keeping the Exim Bank because there's 75 of these export credit agencies around the world. And so my answer was like, OK, we get rid of this. We're going to fight with one hand tied behind her back in international commerce. Like, that's stupid. China is using its Exim Bank as like it has 10 times the amount of money that the U.S. is deploying in its China Exim Bank. And it's using it as a form of, of lending. And it's, a bit, it's like their main lender overseas. And we're going to like not have a U.S. Exim Bank and we're not going to try and set the global standards on export credit agencies. We're out of our mind. So the Trump administration, after a lot of gritting of teeth and grumpiness, that, that's the, the technical term, agreed to reauthorize the Exim Bank for the longest authorization it's ever had and do some fixes to it. And I helped them do that. They also came in saying, we're going to get rid of something called the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. That's also a stupid idea. So after about three or four months, like, mm, that's a dumb idea. They didn't come out and say, hey, we said something stupid and that was a dumb idea. They just course corrected. And then they said, we're going to put the we're going to put OPIC on triple steroids and we're going to create something called the U.S. Development Finance Corporation through something called the Build Act. I was also very involved with that. So when they were presented with challenges, most of the time. We sent we sent serious and re responsible people to run a number of international organizations. David Malpass is a serious person. He ran the World Bank Group. We sent administrator, former USAID administrator Henrietta Ford to run UNICEF. We taught, sent David, Be former governor David Beasley to run the World Food Program. We wrote checks to sustain the multilateral system. We did have our teeth kicked in, and it was a shaming uh, salutary moments, and we talk about it in the book, Ricky, and I'm happy to talk about what, about the FAO election, and I think it, it relates to this multilateral system. But all that is to say that, and then finally, I may say one other thing, that in the case of Ukraine, at least last May, so 12 months ago, there was a, a, a bill in the Congress where 80% of the House Republicans and 80% of the Republicans in the Senate voted for a Ukraine supplemental, paying for weapons and paying for um, economic assistance that paid for keeping the lights on in the government, paying for straight up foreign aid to keep the lights on. So all that is to say, I believe that when presented with the fear of China as a replacement for the United States, the Republican Party in, in it, the vast majority of them, vast majority of leaders in the Republican Party, I can't speak for everybody and I cannot speak for every presidential candidate that's going to run and make sometimes I would describe as very crazy or irresponsible statements and wrong statements. But what I can say is that the vast majority of elected officials in the Republican Party, when presented with the fact, the choice of either let 
doing something that's going to cede space to China or not, and if it's explained to them properly, will not do it. Because if they're if they're explained properly, they will do it. They, they won't do it because uh, they don't want China to lead the world. They continue to want the United States to lead the world. We have a lot of really great questions, Dan. So what I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you questions, and I'm going to ask you to the the second half of the book is like the, the tools you know, your, your solutions in concrete terms. So if I'm going to ask you questions into the best, if you find opportunities to include those tools, do so. And I'm going to, the questions are actually very wide ranging. So we'll start with Cedric Suzman, who says, hi, Dan, good to see you back at the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Do you think President Xi is underestimating the U.S.'s ability and willingness to push back on his aggressive and expansionist policy in Asia and in fact, around the world. Oh, somebody somebody muted Dan. <laughs> you did? You muted yourself? Can you unmute yourself? Mayday. <laughs> Mayday. Okay, oh, there you go. Here we go. Ask, hi, Cedric. Nice to see you. I'm so happy to be here again. So, sorry, please repeat the question. Okay, hang on. So he says, do you think President Xi is underestimating the U.S.'s ability and willingness to push back on his aggressive and expansionist policy in Asia and around the world? I think it's a fabulous question, Cedric. I think that I'm, I'm not, I won't, so I say in the book, I'm not a China expert, but I have two chapters on sort of the development and rise of China and sort of how it's engaging in the world from a soft power standpoint. So if you read my book, The American Imperative, I talk about sort of the rise of China. So let me just kind of make some speculative comments about this. I do think that he, he, she has, um, I think that they are, um, we are very fortunate that, that they have a very ham-handed approach to treating their neighbors. They go out of their way to, to make their neighbors unhappy and abuse their neighbors. If you look at what's happening in the Philippines today, there's been a change in mindset in the Philippines because of the horrible behavior of the Chinese Communist Party towards the Philippines. You've seen a change in behavior in Vietnam over the last 20 years because of that. I think you've seen sort of a, a, a sadly, a hardening of views in places like for, for China, for Australia and Japan. So I think um, I think they are underestimating it. I think they have a fear of the U.S. and the rest of the world kind of leading a coalition to kind of push back against them. And I think they are their actions are. It's not because of grand strategy on our part or sort of grand diplomatic strategy. That a lot of it is just sort of the ham-handedness by which they treat their neighbors. And so I just an example after example, they've done that. Now, in some parts of the world, it's less, if they're not a neighbor, like in Latin America or Africa, we need to understand that if we leave a tr an economic void, like in Africa, a region you know well, Cedric, you know, I think in the 54 African countries, something like 30 of the African countries are uh, the number one trading partner today is Africa, I mean, is, is China. The number one trading partner today is China. And so you ask African business leaders and African government leaders, would they like to see the United States as an economic partner, as a commercial partner? They're like, yes, heck yes, where is the United States? So I think one of the things I talk about in my book is like, we need to have a much more aggressive strategy towards commercial diplomacy. We need to think about them across our U.S. system of using our tools in a more joined up way. We need to have more foreign and commercial service officers in places like Africa. We have the African Growth and Opportunity Act reauthorization that's coming up in, in two years' time. And if you said to me, like, what would be a really good step in sort of this commercial diplomacy space, a simple thing to do would be to not just reauthorize a GOA after 25 years, something I know Cedric and some of the people on this call will be following this more closely than others. But this would be an opportunity, I think, to kind of go and do like a new and improved AGOA, to think about commercial diplomacy, to think about digital connectivity, to more closely link our, our aid and trade as it relates to Africa. But we need to see Africa as a business opportunity, not as a continent to, to, um, where we uh, operate from a foreign aid or in a humanitarian standpoint, because this is not our grandparents' Africa. It's not even our parents' Africa. It's, it's got 300, 400 million middle class. It's got 700 million cell phones. Uh, it's about 50, almost 50% 50 urban. And if we don't see Africa as a business partner, they will take their business to mainland China. And that you're seeing that now. 
And this leads actually into our next question about Haiti from Jim Whipcomb, who mm-hmm. says the U.S. and Canada are hesitating to provide requested military hard power to restore security, viewing it as unlikely to address the underlying causes of perennial instability. Are there soft power alternatives that can be deployed in Haiti? What a great question. Thank you for this. So I just read a super depressing, but really educational book called Written in Blood. I want everyone to go out and buy my book, The American Imperative, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna hawk someone else's book on this call. I read a book that was written in the late 70s, uh, History of Haiti, written by two Americans who had lived in Haiti for a long time. And I think they may have updated it in the 90s. It's called Written in Blood. And it was a sobering, depressing book. Uh, A lot of it had to do with sort of U.S. engagement in Haiti. I think, I don't quote me on this, but I believe the number is something like the U.S. has militarily intervened in Haiti something like 35 times since the 1830s. Now, the Haitians, if there's any Haitians on the call, they'll tell me the exact number because they know. We don't know. We vaguely remember we did something in the, you know, in the 90s. And we, you know, so the problem has been that we had, um, we did send peace. There were, we supported a, a UN mission to Haiti, I don't know, 15 years ago. And it ended really, really badly. There were a number of peacekeepers uh, from different countries who, uh, mistreated people in, in horrible, horrible ways. Um, but also there was, in terms of some of the sanitary practices, created a horrible cholera outbreak that led to many people be dying in Haiti of cholera, which is a terrible thing to happen. So as a result of sort of all of this kind of very bad experiences and having their, the United States and Canada's fingers badly burned in sort of the experience and most recently, um, there's extreme reluctance. I know that I think the term is, a, I forget, I think that, I think we, so if you use the term peacekeeper in the Haitian context, um, that's not sort of a, that's not a, a welcome term. I think it's like a security response, I think is the term that many people who are hate, full-time Haiti watchers will use. Uh, uh, I, you know, there's been, I've been in a number of conversations with Caribbean nations where they're like, we don't want to do this either. So I put together an op-ed, I don't know if you saw it, if you Google my name, Taiwan and Haiti. So Taiwan, Haiti has a, Haiti has a diplomatic relationship with Taiwan. I would suggest that Taiwan could lead a security response in the context of Haiti. It would help the United States, the US doesn't wanna do it. And so everyone will say, they'll kind of furrow their brow and wring their hands and say, isn't it terrible? Haiti's in such terrible shape and my heart bleeds. And then no one wants to do it. If you push them, they'll say they don't want to do it now. And it's not because it's because they've gotten their consistently burned. And it's like, it's been a, they've had bad experiences with sort of, sort of these, this peacekeeping operations. So what I would say is my suggestion would be, is we do need a secure, we need hard power, unfortunately in Haiti, the wet, the U S is not going to provide it unless absolutely forced to, they don't want it. We, the, I, unfortunately, I think the only way the Biden administration will provide security response in Haiti directly in a serious way is if people start showing up on boats in Florida. That that I think is, I think, unfortunately, I think the truth. So I think that what we should be doing now is ask our friends in Taiwan who need the practice on urban combat, and I don't mean to say this in, in a flippant way, I mean this respectfully, but we ought to have, we probably need, I don't know if it's 5,000 troops or 15,000 troops, but Taiwan ought to say, I've got 5,000 troops. I'll be there for you. And I'll do a one-year thing to and make, make sure there's a series, there's some issues around elections and other stuff. And then we ought to get all the other countries that, that Taiwan recognizes, several of whom are in the Caribbean and the Americas, including Guatemala, Paraguay, to send troops. And then the U.S. ought to provide intel and air support and some Creole speakers. That was my suggestion. But I think soft power alone is not going to solve, unfortunately, the problems of Haiti. It does require, and it's sort of like the Reese's peanut butter cups. Like you need chocolate and peanut butter. You need hard power and you need soft power. You just did, you can't. So I'm not saying soft power is a straight up substitute for hard power, but we underestimate the value of soft power. And I'm a Republican and most of my friends in the Republican Party love hard power. They think the soft power stuff is for hippies, that this is like useless hippie stuff. They're wrong. And at the same time, I would say that I think some, you know, so I think we need to understand that it's an important strategic tool in our toolkit. And we need to think about it as that much of our response in the, in the great power competitions around non-military responses. 
But unfortunately, in the case of Haiti, you need some kind of a security response. And I just don't see us anytime soon raising our hand to do it because we've had some we've gotten our, we've got we've had some bad experiences of late. We have questions about the global south, India, uh, Zelensky speaking with, with yeah. President Xi. I was, in, I I was wanna... in Kiev last week, so if people want to ask. Oh, about... okay, great. Yeah. But I want to take a moment to pick up on what you were talking about, thinking that soft power is for hippies. Because yeah. when we talk about expending American effort and especially tax dollars and resources, it's easier to measure the impact of hard power. You win a battle, you win a war. How do you measure the success of soft power? Well, I, I would think about things. So some things are more easy to measure than others. So in the health space, which gets a lot of money, you measure in terms of shots in arms or lives saved. So in the case of PEPFAR, which many of you of the folks on this call will know, it's the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief. Um, that was started in 2003 by President George W. Bush and has been carried through through several administrations and supported by Republicans and Democrats in both houses of Congress. It has saved something like 20 million lives in Africa. It's bent the curve on HIV in in uh, play in many parts of the world and has has been one of the factors in sort of sort of a, a, some of the African Renaissance that we've seen in the last 20 years. Not the only reason, but one of sort of 10 reasons is that PEPFAR allowed, kind of created sort of a lot, you know, uh, you know, you, you kind of took the AIDS issue off the table in Africa somewhat, but largely through PEPFAR. So that's an example of, of kind of measurable. Some things are harder to measure. So some of the investments in democracy and good governance and human rights are much harder to measure. There have been some attempts to do that, uh, some of which have been more successful than others. There was a, a study about 15 years ago that looked at sort of U.S. government, democracy, human rights, and governance in investments over sort of a 15 or 20 year period prior to that, and saw that there were actually, you could prove that invest those investments actually did lead to better quality of governance outcomes. But, you know, so there are people who do that for a living. I think another example is like some of the success stories of a thing like Plan Columbia, which is all people say, oh, that's the only example people use, but let's just use it because I think it's a, 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 a Plan Columbia is a, was a mix of some hard power support, some intelligence support, significant diplomatic support, and a large, uh, large helping of foreign assistance. And this was over starting with the Clinton administration. And you had kind of a great counter, you had a series of 20 years of responsible governments in Colombia. And you had a society in Colombia that was willing to pay more in taxes to pay for a military to ultimately force the FARC and other drug financed Marxist groups to the table for negotiations at peace. So we helped them with that, but we were sort of like five or 10 cents on the dot, whatever we put in was sort of, so I think some of it's about like, are you catalyzing other money? Can you measure it? Do you have a partner on the other side that wants change? And I would argue in the case of Colombia, several things happened. One was that if you were a wealthy Colombian and you went to the World Economic Forum or you sent your kid to the Harvard Business School, and people said, oh, you're from Columbia. I'm really sorry to hear that. And then you'd say, oh, well, like I've seen Miami Vice and you, you must be, so you're here at Harvard Business School. Like, well, where'd you get your money from? Well, I'm in a responsible business. Sure, you're in a responsible business, right? So do you see what I'm saying? Like there was like, if you were in the elite, the amount of headache you had to put up with of being associated with Columbia was so high that people in the elites were like, I don't like this anymore. I don't like going to the World Economic Forum. I don't like my kid going to Harvard Business School. And having sort of like my whole reputation being questioned, my country brand was in the in in the dumps. Okay, so some of it was that. Some of it was also that you had folks in the elites who couldn't you couldn't buy with an additional bodyguard or an additional helicopter or an additional armed car for your ability to get from one place to the other. Like it started becoming impossible. So when it started becoming too difficult, there was a willingness in the society to say like, okay, we need to take a different direction. And then they had tried to negotiate with the FARC in the late 90s, and the FARC proved they were not willing to really negotiate in good faith. So that is when the Colombians said, we need to arm ourselves. We're going to pay more in taxes to pay for an army that we actually need to confront the FARC. We need you to help us with that. But then we also need, when we clear spaces, we need to have a different kind of a social contract. We need a different kind of a social contract with society. So that people, you know, poor people have a shot at life so that they're not attracted to sort of the armed guerrilla groups. 
So it required development and it required a military response and it required diplomacy. And so I would say Plan Columbia is an example of a, a great development, soft power plus hard power success story. I am going to acknowledge our audience that we had said we were going to wrap up at 10, 1245, but I'm going to keep going because we have so many great questions. And if you're game, Dan, I'll I'm give totally you another game. 10 minutes. Okay. Absolutely. So if anybody needs to drop off the Zoom, you're, okay. you're excused. Go and back thanks to work. For your, thanks for doing <laughs> double overtime with us. I'm grateful. But we, I'd like to go through, we've just, we've got a lot of ground to cover. Yep. So Carrie uh, um, Bass asks, how do we show the U.S. citizenry that it is in their best self-interest to care for the well-being of the global South? Well, that is a really good question. So I think, um, I think during, after 9-11, I think we could make the case that, you know, that we, our security was tied to failed states and weak states in other parts of the world in places like Afghanistan. And I think that, that I think for a long, for a period of time, that argument worked. I also think after spending a year in our, everyone spent a year in their basements during COVID. I, I didn't like it. And I'm sure no one on this call liked it. So I would argue that um, sometimes I think how we talk about these things is really important. I think a lot of people who are technical experts oftentimes fall back on technical language I know the technical language and Ricky knows the technical language and many of you on this call know the technical language. But if I wanna explain this, my, my mom and dad are pretty smart people. But if I start talking about like, I don't know, health system strengthening and something or other, like, and I think if you went in to talk to the people in the Trump administration about you're worried about SDG 12 and sub indicator 110, or I'm, I'm worried about health system strengthening and something or other, things to get the hell out of my office. But if you said, do you want another sick COVID infected person showing up at Newark airport? There's a go, how the hell do I stop that? So some of it's about how we communicate this stuff. So I think we need to kind of, without being stupid about it and without being docking down to people, I think we need to level with people and speak to them in ways that are accessible uh, without kind of reverting to kind of the sin of using overly hyped up technocratic language just to just to say just to signal to other people in the technocratic community that I'm smart and I know what I'm talking about. So some of it's that. But I do think we have to, I think I think organizations like the world, there's a reason why you guys exist, actually. So there's a reason like institutions like World Affairs Councils were set up. They were set up because of questions like this one, which was like, how do we engage the American people to make big decisions, whether it was there was the there was a series of councils of foreign relations set up in the 1920s to support the Versailles Treaty, and I suspect this I don't know how old the World Affairs Council of Atlanta was, but I wouldn't be surprised if this was set up around the time of the Marshall Plan. So I wouldn't be surprised if this is more than 50 years old. So and if it was, it wasn't just set up because hey, there's a lot of cosmopolitan thoughtful people in Atlanta who want to get together once in a month to talk. There was a reason why people supported this around the world to say like the country to say. We need thoughtful leaders in, in our local communities to understand what the stakes are in the world, not only for business reasons or religious reasons or for civil society or our values, but because like this stuff matters. And also that you could also engage your house members or your members of the Senate who come home to Georgia. And a lot of them are, you know, are very thoughtful people and then engage with folks like leaders like you. So I think Institutions like the World Affairs Council of Atlanta have an important role to play as an intermediary and convener. So I, again, I appreciate the, the opportunity to be here with you, Ricky. Well, thank you for writing our next brochure. Appreciate You're it. You're welcome. It's true. <laughs> it's true. You can send me the check V later, but it's the, the, the God's honest truth. It's the truth. Well, one of our board members, um, Jagdish Chef, thank you for being here. Jag uh, is somebody who deeply believes in the mission of the council. And we're so glad to have him. And he asked what role India is likely to play in the use of soft power. So I think, so I'm a great admirer of India. I think it's an amazing country. I think they have so much to offer the world. I think they have their creative economy is in the envy of the world. They're exporters of culture and they have a wonderful country brand. Uh, I think the 4 million overseas Indians in the United States have been a wonderful, and made the America stronger and better. I like, I like Governor Nikki Haley a lot. I think she's great. And so I'm grateful for people like uh, uh, Governor Nikki Haley, who's Indian American, but I think there've been leaders in politics, leaders in government, leaders in academia from the overseas Indian community. So I think our country is far, far better for having so many wonderful pe Americans 
who happen to be of, of Indian heritage. So having said all that, I think I'm disappointed on a number of fronts. So I think that um, the, the Indian government has voted the wrong way. I don't, there's four votes in the United Nations on Ukraine. I don't know if they voted for, they voted at least the wrong way on at least two or three of them, basically screwing Ukraine and helping Russia. And the answer is because they buy all their weapons from the Russians. Now we've seen how crappy the Russian weapons are on the battlefield. So that excuse people like India can't hide behind anymore to say, well, I buy Russian weapons. So I got to vote with them. Well, that's a, that's a baloney excuse. And I think it's, it's pathetic. So I think I, it's been very disappointing. People haven't said much about it because they're like, you know, I also think the other thing I would say is I think that uh, India is a really important ally. And I think we decided starting in the Bush administration, we needed to engage with India. Uh, I think that I think that it's important for us to have a good, strong partnership with India. It's important for us to, you know, engage India often. Uh, I think that, um, you know, some of the uh, I would just say that they, you know, on in a number of fronts, we've got some disagreements with them. So I do think that, you know, I think the thesis has been the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I think that in the case of, you know, we've really kind of leaned in on India. And I think, but I think I'm not sure our expectations are going to be met with our Indian counterparts on a number of different fronts. And so I think we just need to go in with our eyes open a little bit on that. And I think we sometimes certainly in Washington, there's like, it's, I, I would argue that the relationship is slightly hyped up as a result of sort of our hopes that they're going to become the next United Kingdom or the next Japan for us in terms of a strategic partner. I, I don't believe that. So I think, but we should be having a lot more trade with India. We don't have as much economic partnership as a, frankly, we ought to. Um, and I just think that um, I, you know, I'm a great admirer of the country and what they've done. And I think the more connectivity with India, the better. Thank you so much for that question and that answer. Mo Winograd asks, what do you expect to come out of Zelensky and President Xi talking? Any reason for Zelensky to trust Xi? <laughs> working on my nonverbal cues, guys. No, the answer is no. So I was, I'm running a, a CSIS. Um, I work at CSIS in my, that's my day job. And um, I've been running a Ukraine Economic Reconstruction Commission. I'm actually at a board meeting for the Western Newly Independent States Enterprise Fund, which focuses on Ukraine and Moldova. I'm on that board. So I'd have told you a year ago, I was really good at a cocktail party on the ish country of Ukraine. Now, a year later, having done a lot on this, I'm a lot smarter about Ukraine than I was a year ago. Uh, what I would say is the, Chi the Chinese Communist Party is screwing Ukraine every chance it can. It has voted the wrong way on all those UN votes. It's watered down all the G20 statements. They buy tons and tons of oil and gas from the Russians, financing the Russian war machine. Xi Jinping visited. So if you're if you're still on, if you're concerned about like war crimes and human rights, Xi Jinping visited Moscow the day after the International Criminal Court declared Vladimir Putin a war criminal and gave him a big hug. So we should all kind of look at each other and say, like, whose side is Xi Jinping on? So we need to understand that the Chinese are not the Ukrainian friend. Now, if somehow they broker a deal, I don't believe it. It's in Xi's interest that Russia not be defeated. It's in it's in Xi's interest that uh, that there's some, that at least that that they also they would also like to potentially get a piece of the reconstruction pie. I would just tell you that people's brains will explode in Washington if somehow you uh, the Chinese who have been so horrible are somehow show up and offer to rebuild Ukraine. I think that would be the, you know, chutzpah, I think is the term of art that comes to mind on the part of the of the Chinese. So I am highly skeptical, put me in the highly skeptical camp that Xi Jinping making this phone call is other anything other than hedging. And, and also he visited Moscow. If he's, so, if, he's so, if he's such an even-handed guy, why does he get on a plane or get on a train like I did last week and visit Kiev? He's not going to do it because he is 100% in the Vladimir Putin camp. Okay, we're going to wrap up with two questions. Our next question hopefully speaks to what comes after the war in Ukraine from Michael Ott, who says, would you consider efforts like demining and other post-war recovery efforts as soft power? 100% yes. So the economy of Ukraine is hands, manufacturing, brains, tech, and grains, agriculture. For us to restart agriculture, we have to do a massive demining exercise. You're absolutely right. 
demining the the uh, the fields and the land of Ukraine is an absolute must to rebuild the country and to restart agriculture. So yes, I 100% agree with you. Yes, and we're and we're going to do something. We we need to do a lot of there's going to be a lot of thinking and work on this topic it needs to happen right now. So I'm glad you're asking this question. So we're going to end uh, actually on the topic of of communication. Uh, Steve Collins says, thank you, Dan, for highlighting the importance of soft power. In my article, Words Matter, Presidents Obama and Trump, Twitter and the U.S. soft power in the, is in the latest issue of World Affairs Journal. Uh, Steve's author, and he argue that the way presidents use social media can profoundly affect U.S. soft power. So the question is, can you speak to the influence of the words presidents use on America's image in the world make a similar argument regarding the dangers and promise of social media in international politics? Wow, Big that is, question. But oh my gosh, I would, say, I, I would look to, to you, Steve, for, for your thoughts about this. I would I, I agree with your thesis and some of the, the points that kind of lead up to the question. I would say that we, uh, I do think we need to speak to people where they are. We need to use different media the media landscape is far more complex than it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Um, I would say that we also need to back up words with deeds. And so I think sometimes we need to also be able to tell a story about, we do lots of good things. And I think, I think we don't tell our story about the great things that we do. Some of it is because for a bunch of different reasons, some of it because of sort of this technocratic gobbledygook that I was talking about earlier. I think that um, the best social media communicator in the world right now is Vladimir Zelensky. So I would not say necessarily that President Biden's the greatest social media communicator. Unfortunately, I would say, I'm gonna put it this way. I'm gonna say that President, former President Trump was an effective, an effective social media communicator. I'm not gonna necessarily say that it was, he certainly could get messages across I'm not sure most, many people, not everyone agreed with his messages, but he was memorable. He was memorable and he was able to reach people. But I would say a, a, a more positive version of that, if I can put it that way, is President Zelensky. I think he's the most able social communicator of our age. And so I think we have a lot, the West and the United States has a lot to learn from President Zelensky about how he communicates with his own people and with the world. He moves people, he speaks to their hearts, he speaks to aspirations. And I still think that matters today. I still think that in a cynical, difficult world with lots of problems, people want to have hope and people want to, um, what people don't want to just think with their heads, they want to think with their hearts. And President Zelensky does that. Dan Rundy, author of The American Imperative, Reclaiming Global Leadership Through Soft Power. Thank you so much for joining us here at the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Thank you, Ricky. Thank you, World Affairs Council of Atlanta. I'm very, very grateful. And for those of you who are still with us, uh, please consider membership in the council. Your support is an investment in everything we do. You can learn more at our website, wacatlanta.org. Reach out to any of us directly. Follow us on social media. And certainly at our website, you can subscribe to our newsletter to learn about upcoming events and uh, opportunities to get together. And Dan, we look forward to seeing you upon your next visit to Atlanta and to the council. Thanks, Ricky. Thanks, everybody. I'm so great. grateful. Thanks again. Have Thanks. a great day. Thank you.